This lecture, we're going to walk through the life of a packet from the sender through to the receiver and how everything works together to make that possible. So really, it's a review of what we covered already, but this is going to tie everything together and it's going to prove to you that you now know the fundamentals of IP networking. So in the example here, we've got host A on the left and it's going to send some HTTP traffic to our web server over on the right, which is www.flackbox.com. It's going to use the FQDN to send that traffic. So it's also going to need to resolve that FQDN name to the IP address using DNS. Also, it's a routed network. We've got different IP subnets there, and we've got a couple of routers in the middle of the topology. I've deliberately included multiple subnets, routers, and a DNS server because I want it to mimic what you would see on a real world network because I want you to be confident that you can work on real world networks and you understand how IP networking actually works. Because of that, there's quite a bit to this example, so it's going to take a little while. So I'm going to split this into two videos. The first part will cover resolving the FQDN to the IP address by DNS. And then the second video will cover the HTTP traffic. Okay, so let's walk through how this is going to work right from the start. So again, we're going to use the OSI stack model for this. Don't worry, this is pretty much the last time you'll see it in the course now, but it's really fundamental to networking works, so that's why you've seen it so many times. So one more time, the OSI reference model, we're going to be composing that web traffic and sending it to the web server from our source on the left. So it will compose the packet, starting off with the information at the application layer. That will then be encapsulated in the presentation layer header, and then that will be encapsulated in the session layer header. Then we get down to the really important information for networking, so layer four, the transport layer. This is web traffic, so it's going to be sent with TCP, and the destination port is going to be port 80. Then when the sender on the left is composing this web traffic, it needs to make the layer 3 header next where it needs to enter the destination IP address and it doesn't know what the destination IP address is because the user just opened up a browser and entered in their www.flatbox.com. So the sender will need to resolve that to an IP address to complete this packet and it's going to use DNS for that. So host A, which is at 10.10.10.10 slash 24, wants to send a packet to the FQDN of www.flatbox.com, but it doesn't know the destination IP address. So it will hold on to that packet, and in the meantime, it will send a DNS request to its DNS server at 10.10.100.10. So the host already knows its IP address, its subnet mask, its default gateway, and its DNS server. Host A will compare its IP address and subnet mask to the destination address of the DNS server, and it sees that it's on a different IP subnet, so the DNS request will need to be sent via its default gateway. Host A will hold the DNS request and send a broadcast ARP request for its default gateway, which is at 10.10.10.1. So you can see that in the diagram here. Host A sends an ARP request. It comes from 10.10.10.10. .10. It says it's looking for its default gateway at 10.10.10.1. And it says, hey, what's your MAC address? So that comes from a source MAC of 1.2.3. And it goes to a destination MAC of the layer 2 broadcast address of f.f.f. The ARP request will be received by switch 1 on the left. Switch 1 will add an entry in its MAC address table mapping host A's MAC address of 1.2.3 to port 1. Switch 1 will then flood that broadcast traffic out all ports apart from the one that it was received on. 
So that will go out part two. The ARP request is still from 10.10.10.10, .10 looking for 10.10.10.1 with a source MAC of 1.2.3, a destination MAC of f.f.f. That will hit router A's interface of 10.10.10.1. Router A will process the ARP request and see that it is for itself. It will then send a unicast ARP reply back to host A. And router A will add an entry for host A, mapping IP address of 10.10.10.10 to the MAC address of 1.2.3, and that will be added to its ARP cache. It will then send the ARP reply. Switch 1 will receive that, and it will add an entry in its MAC address table, mapping router A's MAC address of 4.5.6 to port 2. Switch 1 will then send the ARP reply out only port 1, which host A is plugged into, because the ARP reply is a unicast reply, and the switch already has host A's MAC address in its MAC address table. Isn't It knows it's available out port 1. Okay, so there goes the ARP reply. It says, I'm 10.10.10.1, and here's my MAC address. That came from router A. The source MAC is 4.5.6, and the destination MAC is 1.2.3 on host A. Host A will receive that. It will then add an entry for router A, mapping router A's IP address of 10.10.10.1 to the MAC address of 4.5.6. It will add that to its ARP cache, and it will then use that whenever it needs to send traffic to another IP subnet. Host A will then send the DNS request for www.flatbox.com. So that DNS request, it will say, tell me the IP address of www.flatbox.com, please. It comes from a source MAC of 1.2.3 on host A. It goes to host A's default gateway MAC address of 4.5.6. The source IP is 10.10.10.10 on host A, and the destination IP is its DNS server at 10.10.100.10. That is unicast traffic, so switch 1 will send the DNS request out only port 2, which router A is plugged into, and which the switch already has in its MAC address table. So the DNS request will come into router A, it will receive the request and see that the destination IP address is 10.10.100.10, the DNS server. Router A has an interface in that subnet of 10.10.100.0 slash 24, so it knows that the destination should be available out that port. It doesn't know the MAC address of 10.10.100.10 yet though, so it will hold the DNS request packet and send an ARP request out of the 10.10.100.1 interface. So there goes the ARP request, that's from 10.10.100.1 on the router, it's looking for 10.10.100.10 asking what its MAC address is, it comes from a source MAC of 8.9.a, which is on that interface on the router. The destination MAC is always the same for an ARP request, f.f.f, the layer 2 broadcast address. The ARP request will be received by switch 3. Switch 3 will add an entry in its MAC address table, mapping router A's MAC address 8.9.a to port 1. It will then flood the broadcast traffic out all ports apart from the one it was received on. So that will go down to the DNS server out port 2 as well. Again, the ARP request looks the same. It's from 10.10.100.1, looking for 10.10.100.10, .10 from a source MAC of 8.9.a, destination MAC of f.f.f. So the ARP request hits the DNS server's interface of 10.10.100.10. The DNS server will process the ARP request and see that it is for itself. It will then send a unicast ARP reply back to router A. The DNS server will add an entry for router A, mapping IP address of 10.10.100.1 to MAC address 8.9.a to its ARP cache, and it will use that whenever it needs to send traffic to another IP subnet, because 10.10.100.1 is its default gateway. So there goes the ARP reply from 10.10.100.10, .10, saying here's my MAC address of source MAC 3.4.5, going back to the router at destination MAC of 8.9.a. 
Switch 3 will receive that and it will add an entry in its MAC address table mapping the DNS server's MAC address of 3.4.5 to port 2. It will then send the ARP reply out only port 1 which router A is plugged into because that is a unicast reply and it already has router A in its MAC address table. So there goes the ARP reply unchanged on its way to router A. Router A will receive that. It will then add an entry for the DNS server mapping IP address of 10.10.100.10 to MAC address 3.4.5 to its ARP cache. Router A will then send the DNS request it was holding from host A to the DNS server. Now, the source and destination MAC address of a packet are updated hop by hop, but the source and destination IP addresses always remain the same end-to-end -end unchanged from the original source to the final destination. The source and destination MAC addresses in our example will be updated to come from router A and go to the DNS server for this DNS request. The source and destination IP addresses are still host A at 10.10.10.10 and the DNS server is the destination at 10.10.100.10. So there goes the DNS request. DNS request is saying, tell me the IP address of www.flatbox.com. The source and destination MAC addresses are now changed to be 8.9.a on router A, going to 3.4.5 on the DNS server. The source IP is still 10.10.10.10 on host A. The destination IP is still 10.10.100.10 on the DNS server. Switch 3 will send out only port 2, which is the DNS server plugged into it, which Switch 3 already has in its MAC address table. So the DNS request gets sent down to the DNS server. The DNS server will receive the DNS request packet and see that the destination is itself. So looking at the OSI stack again, it comes in on the physical wire and the receiver will then process the packet starting at the bottom of the stack working its way up. So it sees that the destination MAC address is 3.4.5 which is itself, so it will carry on processing the packet. It sees that the destination IP address in the layer 3 header is 10.10.100.10 which again is itself, it will carry on processing the packet. Then in the layer 4 transport header, it sees that it's UDP and it's on port 53, so it knows that this is a DNS request because DNS uses UDP port 53. It will then pass the packet up the rest of the stack, so it'll look at the session header, the presentation header, and the application header, and it will process that DNS request. The server will look in its DNS database and see an address record for www.flatbox.com at 10.10.12.10. That was configured in DNS. It will send that information back to host A in a DNS response. It knows to send the response to 10.10.10.10 because that was the source IP address in the DNS request. And it knows to send it via router A because router A is its default gateway and the destination is in another subnet. The DNS server already has router A's MAC address in its ARP cache, so it does not need to send an ARP request for this. So the DNS reply says that www.flatbox.com is at 10.10.12.10, the source MAC is 3.4.5, the destination MAC is its default gateway at 8.9.a, source IP is the DNS server at 10.10.100.10, and the destination IP is host A at 10.10.10.10. Switch 3 will receive the DNS response and it will send it out only port 1, which router A is plugged into and which it already has in its MAC address table. So it passes that on to router A. Router A will receive the DNS response packet and see that the destination IP address is 10.10.10.10. It has an interface in the subnet of 10.10.10.0 slash 24, so it knows that the destination should be available out that port. And router A already has the MAC address for 10.10.10.10 in its ARP cache. So again, it doesn't need to send another ARP request. So it will send the DNS reply out that interface. 
Again, it is going from source IP 10.10.100.10 with DNS server going to destination IP 10.10.10.10 host A. So that doesn't change, but source and destination MAC will be updated. Source MAC is 4.5.6 and the destination MAC is 1.2.3, which is the MAC addresses on the left hand side of router A. Switch 1 will receive the DNS response and send it out only port 1, which host A is plugged into and which it already has in its MAC address table. So it passes the DNS reply down to host A. Host A now learns from that DNS response that www.flatbox.com is available at 10.10.12.10. It can now update the packet it was waiting to send to www.flatbox.com with that destination IP address. Host A sees that the web server is not on its own subnet, so it knows that any packets it sends there must go via its default gateway. Okay, so at this point, host A has learned the IP address of the web server through DNS. So now we're looking at the web packet that the host A was holding before it had been able to compose it as far as layer four, but it couldn't put the layer three IP header on there because it didn't know the destination IP address yet. It's just received that from the DNS server so it can carry on composing that packet. It knows that the destination is 10.10.12.10. .10 .10. And it sees that that is on a different IP subnet, so it knows that the destination MAC address is its default gateway, which it already knows is at 4.5.6. It will then put that web traffic onto the physical wire. So here's our HTTP GET request. The source MAC is 1.2.3. The destination MAC is the default gateway, 4.5.6. Source IP is its own IP address, 10.10.10.10, and the destination IP is a web server at 10.10.12.10. That will hit switch one, which will send a packet to router A, which it already has in its MAC address table. The packet will come into router A. It sees that the destination IP address is 10.10.12.10 and in our example, router A does not have any interfaces in the 10.10.12.0 slash 24 subnet. So in that case, it's going to need a route to get there. The route can be either statically configured by an administrator or learned dynamically through a routing protocol, which also would be configured by the administrator. We're gonna cover how to configure static routes and routing protocols in later lectures. So for our example, let's say that the administrator has already configured a static route for 10.10.12.0 slash 24 with the next hop address of 10.10.11.2, which is on the next hop router. Router A has an Ethernet interface in the 10.10.11.0 subnet. It doesn't know the MAC address for the next hop address of 10.10.11.2 yet though. So it will hold the HTTP packet from host A and it will send an ARP request out that interface in the 10.10.11 subnet looking for 10.10.11.2. So there goes the ARP request. It's from 10.10.11.1, saying it's looking for 10.10.11.2. What's your MAC address? It comes from a source MAC of 5.6.7, going to the layer two broadcast address of f.f.f. The ARP request will hit router B's interface at 10.10.11.2 and it will see that the ARP request is for itself. It will send a unicast ARP reply back to router 1. While it's doing that, router B will add an entry for router A mapping the IP address 10.10.11.1 to MAC address 5.6.7 to its ARP cache. So the ARP reply goes back, it says, hey, I'm 10.10.11.2 and here's my MAC address of 6.7.8 going to the destination MAC of 5.6.7. Router A will get that information and it can now forward the HTTP packet it was holding to router B. 
So it's the original HTTP GET request from host A. The source IP is always the same, so it's still 10.10.10.10 on host A, going to the destination IP of 10.10.12.10 on the web server. But the source and destination MAC addresses will get updated for this hop. So the source MAC is 5.6.7, the destination MAC is 6.7.8. Router B will receive the HTTP packet and see that the destination IP address is 10.10.12.10. Router B has an interface in the subnet of 10.10.12.0/24, so it knows the destination should be available out that port, but it doesn't know the MAC address of 10.10.12.10 yet, so it will hold the HTTP packet and send an ARP request out that 10.10.12.1 interface. So there goes the ARP request, it's from 10.10.12.1, looking for 10.10.12.10, asking for the MAC address, comes from a source MAC of 7.8.9, going to the layer 2 broadcast of f.f.f. The ARP request will be received by switch 2. Switch 2 will add an entry in its MAC address table, mapping router B's MAC address of 7.8.9 to port 1, and it will then flood that ARP request broadcast traffic out all ports apart from the one it was received on. So that will be sent out of port 2. The ARP request will hit the web server's interface at 10.10.12.10, the web server will process the ARP request and see that it is for itself. The web server will then send a unicast ARP reply back to router B. And it will add an entry for router B, mapping IP address of 10.10.12.1 to the MAC address of 7.8.9 to its ARP cache. That's its default gateway, so it will use that whenever it needs to send traffic to another IP subnet. So the ARP reply will go back saying I'm 10.10.12.10, here's my MAC address of 2.3.4, going to the destination MAC of 7.8.9. Switch 2 will get that and add an entry to its MAC address table, mapping the web server's MAC address of 2.3.4 to port 2, and Switch 2 will then send the ARP reply out only port 1, which Router B is plugged into, which it already has in its MAC address table. So there goes the ARP reply unchanged from the web server. Router B will get that and ed add an entry for the web server mapping IP address 10.10.12.10 to MAC address 2.3.4 to its ARP cache. And then Router B will send the HTTP request it was holding to the web server. So again, it's the original source IP on host A, 10.10.10.10, the original destination IP on the web server of 10.10.12.10. The MAC addresses will get updated with the source MAC of 7.8.9 and the destination MAC of 2.3.4. Switch 2 will send that HTTP request out only port 2, which the web server is plugged into and which the switch already has in its MAC address table. And finally, the HTTP GET request will reach the web server. So it comes in on the physical wire. The web server will look at the layer 2 header and see that the destination MAC address is 2.3.4, which is itself, so it will carry on processing it. It will look at the layer 3 IP header and see that the destination IP address is 10.10.12.10, which again is itself. It will carry on processing it. It will look at the layer 4 transport header, see that it is TCP, port 80, so it knows it's web traffic. It will then carry on up through the session, the presentation, and the application layer. And the web traffic has now reached the web server. Okay, the ARP and MAC address tables are already built, so any subsequent packets in either direction will flow without any need for ARP requests or switch flooding. So let's say the second packet in the session goes from host A, so it will send the HTTP GET request. It comes from a source MAC of 1.2.3, going a destination MAC of its default gateway at 4.5.6, the source IP 10.10.10.10, destination IP of 10.10.12.10. It already has the destination MAC address in its ARP cache, so it can just immediately send the packet. That will get to router A, which 
also already has everything in its ARP cache. So the HTTP GET request is still from source IP 10.10.10.10, going to the web server at 10.10.12.10. The MAC addresses will be updated to be relevant for this hop, which was a source MAC of 5.6.7, a destination MAC of 6.7.8. That will hit router B. And again, it's got an interface in the subnet of 10.10.12.0, so it knows what interface to send it out of. Source IP remains unchanged, 10.10.10.10. Destination IP is still 10.10.12.10. Source MAC gets updated to 7.8.9. The destination MAC gets updated to 2.3.4. And we've got traffic going end to end. Thanks for watching. If you want to get hands-on practice with Cisco Networks for free, then you can download my 400-page CCNA lab guide, which you can see above my head right now. Also, check out the video about my CCNA course. It's the highest-rated course online. Thanks.